Good morning, I'm Rose Lee. Today we'll feature new advances in non-opiate pain management, discuss how our kidneys play a vital role as a filtering system in our body, and healthy alternatives to improve our diet and overall well-being when we return. Our kidneys play a vital role in our overall health by cleaning our blood, balancing body fluids, and removing waste. Kidneys are made up of about a million little filtering units called nephrons. Each nephron has a filter to rid out the waste, which gets taken out of the body through urine. Autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, or ADPKD, is a rare genetic and progressive disease that affects nearly 140,000 Americans and could lead to kidney failure. Joining us this morning to share information on ADPKD and living with the condition is Dr. Neera Dal, a leading nephrologist at Yale School of Medicine who specializes in diagnosing and treating kidney ailments and genetic kidney disorders. Good morning, Dr. Dahl. Good morning, Rose. Dr. Dahl, ADPKD is both a systemic and an inherited disease that causes cysts to grow in the kidneys. Tell us how this disease is passed on to the next generation. ADPKD is an autosomal dominant kidney disease, which means that it is passed on equally from mom to child or dad to child. That's the autosomal part. Um, it affects both sexes equally. And it's dominant, which means a single mutation, either from mom or from dad, can cause disease in a child. So it's autosomal dominant. Each child has a 50% chance of inheriting the disease from their parent. So how do nephrologists determine a family's history of the disease? And what type of tests are used to diagnose ADPKD? So we determine the, the presence of the disease first by family history. If there's a clear history of people developing end-stage kidney disease or kidney failure, um, that's very important. If there's a history of enlarged cystic kidneys, that's very important. And then it's diagnosed by imaging, either by an ultrasound or CT or MRI of the abdomen to look for cysts in the kidney, sometimes cysts in the liver that help us make the diagnosis. How can we better understand this rare kidney disease that could possibly be lurking within our genes? What happens after the diagnosis? After the diagnosis is made, we talk to the patients about what their individual risk of developing kidney uh, failure is. And based on that, we come up with management strategies unique for that patient. And those could include lifestyle choices, uh, diet choices, uh, different choices in terms of uh, medications for treatment of blood pressure and other potential management strategies that are possible for this disease. All right, tell us, Dr. Dow, what are some of the signs and symptoms of ADPKD and the health issues that are a result of this kidney disease? So related to the kidneys, the signs and symptoms are related to those expanding kidney cysts. This could lead to flank pain or back pain. This could lead to blood in the urine to the development of high blood pressure or hypertension. So those would be common kidney-associated signs and symptoms of ADPKD. So when the patients become lethargic or really tired, is that when they seek medical advice? So really early on, uh, they don't develop the lethargy or tiredness. That comes much, much later on as patients are approaching kidney failure. The early signs are subtle, so it may simply be flank pain or back pain or an episode of blood in the urine that's otherwise unexplained. And because of that, we really encourage people who are at risk, who know that this disease is in their families, to come in and have a conversation with us and to talk about getting screened and talk about other management strategies. All right, so what can patients living with progressive ADPKD do to increase their quality of life? There are a lot of different management strategies that they can uh, use to increase their quality of life. Obviously, that's very, very important. Um, and we really encourage people to get educated about the disease, 
One of the websites I really like for that is pkdinfo.com, where there's a lot of information on how to take the fear away from the diagnosis and really focus on managing the disease, getting active, getting uh, empowered to, to take charge of that condition. Patients with progressive ADPKD, can they enjoy their lives? So absolutely, that's really what we want to encourage patients to do, to really um, live their best possible lives with this condition. And there's a lot that we know now about managing the disease and managing the complications. Um, that's new in the last five to 10 years, and we really encourage patients to come in and have a conversation with a nephrologist or kidney specialist. Thank you, Dr. Dahl, for joining us this morning to share important information of the signs and symptoms of ADPKD and new advances to treat this kidney disease. Thank you for having me. Did you know Americans throw away 25% more trash during the holidays from Thanksgiving to New Year's than any other time of the year? The extra waste amounts to 25 million tons of garbage, or about 1 million extra tons per week. Think about it. If every family reused just two feet of holiday ribbon, we could save 38,000 miles of ribbon. If every American family wrapped just three presents in reused materials, it could save enough paper to cover 45,000 football fields. And think about 2.65 billion Christmas cards that are sold each year in the U.S. Those cards could fill a football field 10 stories high. Recycle and reusing packaged cartons and shipping materials is another way to save. By outdoor light strands that are wired in parallel. So if one bulb goes bad, the others still work. This way, you won't be throwing away bad strands. Put all your lights on timers for energy saving and peace of mind while you're away visiting others. Recycle unwanted and duplicated gifts by promptly exchanging them or giving them to a local charity. Keep it simple. One thoughtful gift is better than six wrapped packages of unwanted gifts. Be creative with gift experiences like music lessons or a new hobby, a massage or tickets to a sporting event or a play. Give a monetary donation to a local charity in someone else's name. Many people feel very good about themselves if they're helping someone during the holidays. Now is the time for Floridians to get ready to rethink, reset and recycle. It's time to rethink what we recycle and reset our behavior. By eliminating 30% of contaminated materials in curbside recycling bins. Florida taxpayers could save $100 million in recycling costs in just one year. The problem is wish cycling or well-intentioned recycling that causes more problems than solutions. Like contaminated recycling bins with items not meant to be there, such as So what can Floridians do? Stick to the basics. Make sure each item is clean and dry before going into the curbside recycling bin. When in doubt, throw it out. Avoid recycling these items at curbside. Spread the word. One of the best ways to make an impact is by helping those around you understand the do's and don'ts of recycling. So, rethink, reset, recycle at floridarecycles.org. Mentoring opens doors for students and job seekers with disabilities. Open the door to an all-inclusive workplace. Watch the upcoming episodes of Disability Mentoring and get involved in your community. Be a mentor. Did you know C-sections 
are the number one surgery in the U.S. Each year, 1.3 million pregnant women deliver their babies by C-section. There's been many advancements in women's health care, but not in childbirth and major surgery like C-section. Truth is, there's been a lack of major breakthroughs in pain management for women since the 1980s when the epidural became common, leaving new mothers with opiates as the only choice to manage their pain following a C-section. Mothers need to deal with pain while trying to bond with their newborn. When pain is not properly managed, it can interfere with a mother's ability to care for herself and her baby, resulting in an impaired ability to bond and breastfeed. Fortunately, now there are effective non-opiate options to manage pain after C-section deliveries. Joining us this morning to highlight advances in opiate alternatives is Dr. Elizabeth Chereau, expert in obstetrics and gynecology. Good morning, doctor. Hi, Rosalie. Thanks for having me. Childbirth is often the first time a woman is exposed to opiates or other pain medications. So tell us what do expecting moms need to know about C-sections and what happens after the surgery? Thanks so much. Um, I, I do think in my practice it's something we have a discussion with starting at 36 weeks um, about pain control after surgery and what alternatives there are. Women, uh, if they can have an, an opioid minimizing procedure, uh, will absolutely, like you discussed, having you know breastfeed better, be able to move about better, you know get up to the bathroom, less constipation, um, less side effect. The opioid isn't in their breast milk. Um, it really is a, a, a better uh, type of procedure. Can the opiates infiltrate the breast milk? How will that affect the infant? Infants can uh, absolutely be drowsy, have difficulty breastfeeding. Um, so if we can minimize that, we try to. So during our, in my practice, we use a long-acting numbing medication at the time of closure of uh, the C-section. Um, we actually put it right into the incision, just like you would at a dental procedure, have long-acting numbing medication. Uh, and so patients will also use Tylenol and Motrin for their pain control afterwards. Wow, amazing. So how do you envision the new standard of care for women? What should we aspire to? Great question, Rosalie. Listen, I, uh, we believe that at Axia Women's Health that uh, women deserve more. Uh, they should have that conversation with their provider, discuss uh, their different options, uh, be able to have uh, choices uh, and advocate for themselves and, and be able to have an open opioid minimizing procedure. Doctor, you said earlier that you walk around without your prescription pad any longer. You regularly use a non-opiate medication to help women. So how does that effectively combat the pain? We, we do. We actually, it, it, it's been used, x has been around for, I don't know, since 2012. Um, over 6 million patients have used it. In my practice, it's standard to use for any C-section to, to use it at, at the time of closure, as I said. And um, we really try and encourage patients to take uh, Motrin and, and Tylenol afterwards. I haven't prescribed an opioid in months. I no longer walk around the hospital with my prescription um, as it's not needed. Uh, and, and that discussion starts roughly at 36 weeks, but in, I encourage all women to talk to their patients about it. So, Doctor, you have this conversation with your patients and discuss pain management options, and some women are concerned about managing the pain. There's so many side effects to pain meds. What are some key benefits of utilizing non-opiates for moms-to-be? Sure, uh, you know, surgery is painful. We need to be able to manage that patient and be able to uh, not, you know, it's never going to be painless. Um, it needs to be managed well. It needs to be a shared opportunity to have a, that conversation with that patient. We don't expect the patient to, um, to, to be, like I said, to be painless throughout the procedure um, or after, but it, it should be a joint decision about what prescriptions are needed. And how does that impact their recovery? Well, they certainly can walk sooner. They, um, I, I mentioned constipation. They uh, also usually can like, bond better with their, their newborn, their other child, be able to take care of that three-year-old that's at home, or maybe that three and five-year-old at home, um, able to take care of themselves better, uh, and really feel like they're recovering on a better pathway. Opiates can leave you with an edgy feeling that affects a mom's responsibilities 
and her entire family. It upsets everyone, right? Yeah, I mean, think about it, feeling a little bit dizzy, maybe a little bit out of it, um, not being able to make decisions for yourself and, and being groggy and tired when uh, you're still, you're up all night taking care of a newborn, that additive opioid, if you could avoid altogether, uh, imagine your recovery without that. How has the opiate epidemic affected your area of medicine? Earlier you said you don't prescribe opiates anymore. Is this the norm in your practice? Rosalie, in my practice it is. We, we really don't. Uh, I would say we've reduced our opioids by 87%. Uh, I would say over 70% of my patients go home with no opioid uh, prescription at all. They're able to take Motrin or, or um, you know, Tylenol, they're not bringing home that opioid prescription, you know, that they themselves would take or, or God forbid, somebody else in their family would take. Um, so to avoid that prescription altogether is really our goal. So doctor, one more question. Are some patients more prone to get addicted from opiates than others? I'd have to refer you um, elsewhere. I, I haven't studied that um, in detail. I, I would say to you that every woman uh, has a pain score um, or a comfort level or discomfort level with surgery. Uh, I, I really encourage patients to go to csectionpain.com and download their guide and have that frank conversation with their patients. Thank you so much, Dr. Chereau, for sharing advances in pain management using non-opiate alternatives for C-section surgeries. Thank you. Mentoring opens doors for students and job seekers with disabilities. Open the door to an all-inclusive workplace. Watch the upcoming episodes of Disability Mentoring and get involved in your community. Be a mentor. the season to shop and the Federal Trade Commission has trusted tips to protect consumers. So if you're looking for a hotel for a getaway or a new pair of shoes, it's likely you'll search online for customer reviews from five stars, likes, thumbs up, or must buys. A positive opinion could impact your decision to buy it or try it. Blogs, websites, and social networks are great resources. You may not have the whole story though. For example, your Facebook friend who gushes about a new dog food may be receiving free dog food in exchange for her glowing review. Or the hotel with a five-star rating might have a paid blogger to write a stellar review. While the law from the Federal Trade Commission says reviewers should disclose their connection to the company, not all of them do. It can be difficult to tell if the reviewer has a connection to the company. So before you buy anything based on a review, do an internet search. Look for credible opinions from trusted sources. Compare reviews from a variety of websites. And in the end, it pays to learn as much as you can. Learn more at onguardonline.gov forward slash shopping. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, nearly 30 million Americans have diabetes. Here in Florida, it's 2.4 million people with diabetes and 5.8 million adults who have pre-diabetes. That is 38.7% of the adult population in Florida. People with diabetes have medical expenses that cost almost two and a half times more than people who do not have diabetes. So here to create awareness of the risk of diabetes and encourage people to make healthy diet changes is Latina chef Leticia Murano Schwartz, healthy cuisine author of three cookbooks. Good morning, Leticia. Good morning, Rosalie. Leticia, you've been very busy working on a new cookbook entitled Touch of Sugar as a part of America's Diabetes Challenge Program. Tell us about this work. So let me tell you, A Touch of Sugar is actually the name of the documentary that I've been working. And um, 
Type 2 diabetes is a very personal topic to me. My grandfather died from uh, complications of the disease, and my grandmother really didn't have the right resources and the right information to help him cope with the disease. And as a chef and as a Latina, I understand some of the common challenges that Hispanics face across the nation, but also in Florida, like eating healthy, exercising, and working with your doctor on a treatment plan that's right for you. And just like you said, Rosalie, there is an alarming fact here. Almost 12% of the Hispanic population in the country is already diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. That's why I joined forces with Merck on this documentary called A Touch of Sugar, which really raises awareness about type 2 diabetes, especially among among underserved communities. Over 26% of the population of Florida is Hispanic. And type 2 diabetes is expected to affect more than 50% of Hispanic men and women in the U.S. over their lifetimes. Leticia, how are you addressing the significant concern among the Hispanic community? Well, we hope that after watching the movie, people will realize that they're not alone in this journey. There is a lot of people going through the same issue. And what we hope to do is to bring people together to make fundamental changes to the way that we treat, support, and advocate for people living with type 2 diabetes. The goal of the movie is not only to raise awareness about type 2 diabetes, but to sparkle change, change in lifestyle style, you know, change in actions, and ultimately to help, you know, America confront this epidemic head on, one community and one patient at a time. Leticia, like yourself, my grandmother and father passed away from the ravages of diabetes. And my father had tremendous complications. He had vascular disease, and he was amputated twice. So there's so much we don't know about the effects of diabetes. Can you help us learn more? Absolutely, and diet is such an important part of managing type 2 diabetes because it can help you achieve your A1C goal. A1C is really a blood exam that doc doctors use to look at your sugar levels over a period of two to three months. And it's one of the key factors in managing type 2 diabetes. And again, as a chef, you know, I come up with recipes that are great for the whole family. It's a fun activity. I really want to inspire through this movie and through my work, people to come together in the kitchen and cook together, talk together, have fun in the kitchen. So I have recipes, you know, like for example, uh, a salad with smoked salmon and mango and arugula and Moroccan meatballs, you know, that are great for the whole family to cook together. One of the worst things that you want to do when you have type 2 diabetes is isolate a member of the family. Absolutely. I get my son to have hands on when it comes to prep work as well as the cleanup work. And it takes lots of responsibilities off my shoulders. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Each year, there's about 105,000 people in Florida that are diagnosed with diabetes. How can America's Diabetes Challenge help Floridians? So we really want people to use this documentary as a tool. We want to arm people with information. We want to, to be the center for education about type 2 diabetes. Leticia, where can our viewers find more information on America's Diabetes Challenge and A Touch of Sugar documentary? We want people to come to our website, A Touch of Sugar Film, and if they ask us to see the link, to see the, 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 the documentary, we can give them the link to the movie, or even if people want to host screenings, you know, for their communities, just ask us, get in touch with us, visiting a touchofsugarfilm.com. Thank you, Leticia, for all of your delicious, healthy cuisine tips and sharing your good work to help people with diabetes improve their eating habits and overall health and wellness. Thank you so much, Rosalie. It's a pleasure. Did you know America
Americans throw away 25% more trash during the holidays from Thanksgiving to New Year's than any other time of the year? The extra waste amounts to 25 million tons of garbage, or about 1 million extra tons per week. Think about it. If every family reused just two feet of holiday ribbon, we could save 38,000 miles of ribbon. If every American family wrapped just three presents in reused materials, it could save enough paper to cover 45,000 football fields. And think about 2.65 billion Christmas cards that are sold each year in the U.S. Those cards could fill a football field 10 stories high. Recycle and reusing packaged cartons and shipping materials is another way to save. It's time to rethink what we recycle and reset our behavior. By eliminating 30% of contaminated materials in curbside recycling bins. Florida taxpayers could save 100 million in recycling costs in just one year. The problem is wish cycling or well-intentioned recycling that causes more problems than solutions like contaminated recycling bins with items not meant to be there, such as So what can Floridians do? Stick to the basics. Make sure each item is clean and dry before going into the curbside recycling bin. When in doubt, throw it out. Avoid recycling these items at curbside. Spread the word. One of the best ways to make an impact is by helping those around you understand the do's and don'ts of recycling. So, rethink, reset, recycle at floridarecycles.org. We are all looking forward to the new year. And here at Rosalie Productions, we want to tell you how grateful we are that our viewers continue to watch The Rosalie Show for over 23 years. And I am personally grateful for my wealth of health so that I can use my abundant vitality to energize my life, to pass on my blessings to my family and friends. So share with us your wealth is health blessings that you pass on to those you love at facebook.com forward slash Rose Lee Show. And follow us on Instagram at The Rose Lee Show. And watch this episode and many others 24 7 at rosaleearchershow.com. So, from all of us at Rose Lee Productions, we wish you and your family a happy and healthy new year.